according to the doe of the dawn, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are who he took me, rather, yet you are who he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Thanks, Paul. G'day, my name is Chris. I'm one of the staff members here at St. Matthias Anglican Church. Please keep your Bibles open or your devices up. We'll be looking at that pass passage quite closely. But before we do, how about I pray? Our Heavenly Father and gracious God, we thank you that you have not left us alone in the dark, but that you have revealed yourself to us in the Bible and you've shown us how we can know you through your son Jesus. And so as we look at Psalm 22 tonight more closely, we pray that you would not leave us in despair, but point us forward to the risen Lord Jesus and fill our hearts with hope tonight. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let me start by telling you about a guy called Clive who doesn't come to this church. Clive came to know Jesus as an adult. Uh, he was a lecturer at uni and he spent a lot of time arguing with Christians um, about Jesus. Over time, uh, he became convinced. Yes, the Bible is reliable. Yes, Jesus did live. Yes, he died and rose from the dead. 
Clive put his trust in the Lord Jesus. He became a Christian and he fervently followed him. Many years later, this fervent faith in Jesus fell to pieces. You see, Clive met a lovely Christian woman named Joy and they married, but three years later, Joy was diagnosed with cancer. Really soon after that, she passed away. Clive had been single all his life, became a Christian, he got married, and she passed away, leaving Clive alone. Clive kept a diary of his feelings. Soon after his death, he wrote this, Where is God? Go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is in vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face and a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. There are no lights in the windows. It might be an empty house. Why is God so present, a present commander in our time of prosperity and so very absent a help in time of trouble? Uh, Clive's full name is Clive Staples Lewis. That's C.S. Lewis for short. A man who was so strong in the faith that he wrote these great books, these great classic Christian books like Mere Christianity, The Chronicles of Narnia, um, and a book called A Grief Observed. That's where this quote comes from. A man who was so strong in his faith and then it all fell to pieces. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, friends, I take it that many of us can identify with how C.S. Lewis felt. Now, a lot of, I know a lot of people in this room are younger than me. Harrison Riley remind me of that all the time. Uh, and, but it would be naive of me to think that people who are younger than me have not suffered like C.S. Lewis. I'm sure there are people here tonight, in fact, I know there are people here tonight who have. Maybe it was a cancer diagnosis. Maybe it was the breakdown of a marriage. Maybe it was the struggle with infertility or the death of a loved one. Now, it's true that some of us have these stories, yeah? These stories of going through difficult times and how God gave us this special sense of his presence to help us or even delivered us in miraculous ways. And they are wonderful stories and they are great strengths to our faith. But sooner or later, many of us will experience what C.S. Lewis went through. And in our time of greatest need, it will feel like God has abandoned us. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So friends, what do you do when you feel abandoned by God? What do you do in those dark nights of the soul when it feels like God has given up on you? Well, friends, we read Psalms together, like Psalm 22. You see, in Psalm 22, we have a story of God's King. It's a story or, or a journey from despair to deliverance. David expresses his deep and painful sense that God has forsaken him. But Psalm 22 doesn't leave us alone in that despair. Psalm 22 points us forward to Jesus because in Jesus, we are never abandoned by God. God's true king, who was abandoned, God's true king was abandoned by God so that we would never be abandoned by God. Three points today, they'll come up on the screen. The deliverance of God's king, the suffering of God's king, and the suffering of God's true king. So let's start with the first one. Uh, for the context of the psalm, have a look at the heading. That's not the big bold thing next to Psalm 22. That's from the editors or the publishers of the ESV. Um, it's the little, it's the shorter one. Sometimes it's in italics, maybe if you've got an NIV. It says, to the choir master, according to the doe of the dawn, a psalm of David. This tells us that the psalm was written by David to the choir master. And so while we don't know the exact event in which David wrote this psalm, it does tell us that it was written as a song 
It's got a tune. Apparently it was called Doe of the Dawn. I don't know what that sounds like. We, we don't have that today. Um, but it does tell us that this would either be sung or performed in the temple as part of Israel's worship of God. And as David starts his psalm, he invites us into his suffering to ask God why. Have a look at verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God. I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. David is experiencing an agonizing distance from God. The God that called Israel his treasured possession, the God that promised to never leave or forsake his people, that God is far away. It feels like he's abandoned, David. That God doesn't answer. It feels like God is silent. And so under the weight of despair, he lays awake at night, fearing the worst. You see, to be forsaken by God is for God, sorry, is to be put to shame by God. So David cries out to God and asks him why. He says, why have you abandoned me? And if you've cried out to God in this same way, you know he's not looking for information. This is a rhetorical question. He's not looking for an explanation or a theological essay or even a well-minded friend to offer him a book to read. David cries out to God because David wants God to listen, to act, and to rescue him from his suffering. And so David is caught in this internal conflict We see it played out in the psalm. Have a look at the psalm. Uh, We see it in verse 3. David says, yet you are holy. And then he says in verse 6, but I am a worm. In verse 9, he says, you took me from my mother's womb. Uh, Verse 19, but you, O Lord, do not be far off. You see, on the one hand, David knows who God is. But on the other, it doesn't match his life experience. And so he cries out for deliverance. Have a look at verse 3. Yet you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. They, to you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. I take it that David here is remembering the great rescue story of the Old Testament. That's the Exodus. When his forefathers were rescued from slavery in Egypt... When God's people were in trouble, Exodus 2 tells us that they cried out to God. They trusted God and God heard their cries. He heard their prayers. He remembered his promises. He listened, he acted and he saved his people, which means God is a holy God, verse 3, because he is faithful to his people and he keeps his promises. But this is not David's experience. Look at how David feels in verse 6. He says, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Can you feel how cutting those words are? Uh, David's fathers in the Exodus they were not put to shame because David, sorry, because God heard their cries and they were honoured, they were rescued. But here, it's completely the different story for David. He feels like a despised, worthless worm, the kind of insect that you squash under your shoe. That's because he's being put to shame. The only thing he clings to is a trust in the Lord, which is ironic because his trust in the Lord is what these people mock him for. You see, God had made some big promises to David. In Psalm 2, God's king is promised that he'll be given the inheritance of the nations and he is the one who will rule the world and crush the enemies of God. In In Psalm 20, we read that the Lord saves his anointed, That's his anointed king. He will answer him from his holy heaven and he will save him with his right hand. O Lord, save the king. May he answer us when we call. And in Psalm 21, the king trusts in the Lord. 
and through the steadfast love of the Most High, that's God, the king shall not be moved. These are some big promises from God about his king. David is God's anointed king. He's the hero of Israel. He knows that God has promised to always hear his prayers and to save him. And this is why David is expecting God would save him. But also, this is where the pain lies. Because David is caught in this collision between his knowledge of God on one hand and his experience of life on the other. He knows God is holy and rescues his people, but his experience paints a picture of a different God, a God who is silent, who is absent, and has abandoned his people. And it's the absence of God that's unbearable. So David prays for deliverance, but it hasn't come. And it's interesting It's interesting how quickly David moves from an experience like Psalm 21, where all the promises about God are good, sorry, about God's king are good, to something like Psalm 22, where it feels like those promises aren't for sure. It reminds us that the expectations of God's king and how quickly they can change to suffering and despair. And friends, we know what this is like, don't we, in 2020 with COVID? This year, plans have drastically changed. Holidays have had to be cancelled. Um, I was reminded about this uh, earlier in the week with our Easter services. Do you remember Easter, that thing that was supposed to happen earlier in the year and kind of didn't? Um, at church, we had printed these huge, beautiful banners that James Marquette had designed. We printed f- over 500 flyers that we were going to hand out. It was the week that we were ready to put the banner up and go and hand out the flyers that isolation happened. We went from planning Easter services and inviting people to church to pre-recorded sermons and locking the front doors of our church. That happened in the space of a week. Now, that might feel like a trivial example, But it's strange, isn't it, that often the most devastating things happen the quickest. The end of a relationship. The detection of late-stage cancer. The loss of a children's life. And we're caught in that same agonising collision. See, on one hand, we know our Bibles, yeah? We know that God is a good God, a holy God who keeps his promises. And on the other... Our experience of life makes it feel like God has abandoned us. And the stories of rescue and deliverance, sadly, can actually make it harder for us to keep trusting in God. So what do you do? Friends, what do you do when it feels like God has abandoned you? Let's go back to Psalm 22 and see what David does. What does David do amidst his suffering? This is our second point, the suffering of the king. Have a look at verse 9. He says, yet you are he who took me from the womb and made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me for trouble is near and there is none to help. David describes God, it's quite interesting, like a midwife. Did you pick that up? As David feels the absence and abandonment of God, he remembers God's presence, God's closeness, and that he trusted in God. That is, God was worthy of his trust. It was the right and good thing to do. But that's not his experience. He goes on to explain the trouble that is happening. Uh, If before it was an absence and silence of God, now it's from other people. And these people, he describes them like animals. Have a look at verse 12. He says, they're like strong and fierce bulls of Bashan. Verse 13, he says, these people are like hungry lions. Verse 16, they're like wild dogs circling him. And that's kind of like vultures waiting for David to die. These verbal attacks have now turned into physical attacks. David's hands are pierced. He's close to death. He's like water poured out. His bones are all out of joint. His mouth is dry. 
He feels like these are the final hours of his life. And so he says, you lay me in the dust of death. Basically, he says, kill me now. For David, this terrible suffering is what it feels like to be totally abandoned by God. And so David concludes this section with one last final plea. Have a look at verse 19. He says, But you, O Lord, do not be far off. You, O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. As David is caught between what he knows about God and his experience of life, he cries out to God for help. And the question we're left with is, in this psalm, is David rescued? That's a question I have for you to discuss. In this psalm, is David rescued? I'm going to give you a minute to turn to the person next to you and ask them, is he rescued? Go. Okay, please keep those conversations going after church. We're going to give you an opportunity to chat to people around you, so maybe you want to chat about that more. Uh, Friends, this is a a heavy psalm, so it's good for us to have a bit of a commercial break, but also it's good for us to keep reading this psalm together as God's people. Um, So the question was, in in this psalm, is David rescued? Uh, I believe the answer is no. I believe the answer is no. David isn't delivered, but anticipates it in the future. I'll explain what I mean. Uh, David cries out to God. He says, uh, you have rescued your people in the past. He prays for rescue. And then he says, you have rescued me. Did you notice that in verse 21? I have another look at verse, uh, we'll start from verse 20. He says, Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. Uh, And then he goes on to say, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. And so Psalm, the last line in Psalm 21 is almost like a hinge or a turning point. That is, from where David goes from despair to deliverance, from rescue. The trick is, in verse 22, it's future tense. I will tell. That is, David is making a vow. He is anticipating being rescued in the future, but at the point of writing this psalm, he is not. That is, David is not rescued in this psalm. David is not delivered. So what does he do? Well, he doesn't just praise God with kind of empty words. He doesn't fake it till you make it. He looks ahead to the promises of God. Have a look at verse 22 with me again. He says, I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation, I'll praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All the offspring of Jacob glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. 
David says he will tell God's name amongst the con- to his brothers amidst the congregation. So that's not his biological family, that's the family of God. That's the temple. He vows to praise God in the temple. But now, in the midst of his suffering, God has not rescued him. But David keeps trusting in God. Now, we know from the life of David that God does rescue David. I mean, time and time again, God is rescued, sorry, David is rescued from Saul, David is rescued from enemies, David is rescued from death. But at the time of this, he's not rescued. But he still trusts in God and still submits to God. He looks forward, have a look at verse 27. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. If these verses sound familiar, they're echoes of God's promises to Abraham in Genesis 12, promises that are not yet completely fulfilled. So David looks forward, and in looking forward to the promises of God, he is able to trust God. God in his suffering. He takes God at his word. He trusts God's character. And he trusts that God will always keep his promises. And so this is how David continues to trust in God even in his suffering, even when there's no sign of rescue, even when he's close to death. And when he does this, the psalm takes on a greater meaning. You see, David points us forward to a greater rescuer, that is, a greater king, God's true king, Jesus Christ. And we who live on this side of the cross, we know that verse 27, Jesus is the name that will go to the ends of the earth. And it's Jesus that all the, names will wor- all the nations will worship. Verse 28, Jesus is God's true king, and it's Jesus that will rule over the nations. And so Psalm 22 is a psalm in which David trusts amidst his suffering, even though he is not rescued. And it points us forward to Jesus, the suffering of God's true king, which is our third point. Uh, We see this really clearly with Matthew chapter 27. That was our first Bible reading. Um, Now, Psalm 2 is not prophetic. We need to be careful. Psalm 2 is not, pro- sorry, Psalm 22 is not prophetic in the same way that the book of Isaiah or the book of Ezekiel is a prophetic. But it does have a prophetic character. That is, Jesus does fulfill these sufferings of David that we read in Psalm 22. And Matthew, the gospel writer, wants us to see the link. So a, a picture should come up. Ah, it's there. Okay, squint your eyes. I'll go through this quickly. In Psalm 22 and Matthew 27, both kings are mocked for trusting in God. In Psalm 22 and Matthew 27, both kings' clothes are divided by casting lots. And in Psalm 22, David cries out to God. In Matthew 27, verse 46 that we read earlier, Jesus says those same words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so Jesus is not just, um, not just praying these words to God, but he's taking Psalm 22 and he's applying it to himself. Psalm 22 helps us to understand the sufferings of God's true king as Jesus hung on the cross You see, if David experienced the pain and anguish of feeling like he was abandoned by God, then how much more must the pain and anguish have been for Jesus when he was abandoned by God? He had enjoyed, Jesus had enjoyed perfect unity and love with his Father for all eternity up until that point. He'd never known a shadow of separation or spiritual distance from the Father. But on the cross, God the Son cries to God the Father and there is no answer. Now, just to be clear here, Jesus is not, sorry, the Gospels are not saying that Jesus ceased to be God at this point. They're not saying that the Trinity was split, not at all. When Jesus cries out to God the Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's in the cry of desolation that Psalm 22 speaks most powerfully of Jesus' suffering. 
So in a way that we will never fully understand, the Son, who from eternity past had known the presence and perfect love of the Father, lost all sense of his presence. And while he was still aware that God was his Father, and his sense of being, but his sense of being abandoned by God was real and horrible. And he did this, Jesus was forsaken by God because Jesus was standing in our place. When Jesus died on the cross, he was bearing our sins. When his blood was shed, he was paying the penalty for our sins. But he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose again, declaring to the world that he had defeated sin and death once and for all. Which means... When Jesus was on the cross and cried out for rescue, God the Father did not rescue Jesus from dying. But he did rescue him from death. I'll say that again. Uh, God the Father did not rescue Jesus from dying, but he did rescue him from death through the resurrection. This means that when we put our faith in Jesus and repent of our sins, God forgives us of our sins and reconciles us to himself and promises to never leave or forsake us. Romans 8 puts it this way, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor everything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, a wonderful news of the gospel is that God has turned his face away from Jesus so that he might turn his face towards us in forgiveness, mercy, and love. Jesus was abandoned by God so that through faith we would never be abandoned by God. Which means even when I feel like God has abandoned me, I know the truth. You know the truth. That nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. But what happens when we're caught in that same collision as David? You know, what do we do when our knowledge of God doesn't match with our experience of God? Or put simply, what do we do when we pray to God and he doesn't rescue us? Uh, Over the last few weeks, I've been really encouraged as we've looked at the Psalms of Lament, haven't you? We've looked at Psalms like Psalm 30 and asked, How long, O Lord? Which kind of seems appropriate during COVID. Uh, We looked at Psalm 11 and asked, uh, Can we take refuge in the Lord? And they've always ended on this happy note. Did you notice that? I mean, the writer at the end of the Psalm is rescued. And then we have shared these stories about how God has rescued us from suffering. And it's been really encouraging But what happens when it doesn't end well? What happens when God doesn't deliver you from that pain, from that suffering, even from from death itself? If it feels like God has given up on us, is it right to give up on God? Friends, what we see tonight in Jesus Christ, that God has not abandoned us. And God will not leave or forsake us. And again, that is a truth that we must find assurance in because it's based on the promises of God and his good character. So what do we do when God doesn't answer our prayers? Well, we gather together like we've done tonight and we read Psalm 22 together. When we don't know how to pray, Psalm 22 gives us words to pray. It gives us permission to cry out to God that you would not feel ashamed for asking God why this is happening. And when we can't reconcile our knowledge with God and our experience of life, Psalm 22 gives us a firm foundation of the truth about God, that he is a good God, that he's a holy God, and he keeps his promises. And when we feel abandoned by God, Psalm 22 points us forward to Jesus. It reminds us of Jesus' death on the cross, the assurance that we have in Jesus Christ that God has not given up on us, that God will never leave or forsake us, 
And so that we, it encourages us to keep trusting in God and looking forward as we wait for him to return. Because sometimes that's all we can do. Uh, that's what C.S. Lewis did. Uh, if we go to the next slide, at the end of his book, Grief Observed, he talks about how the only thing he could do was to cling to God. He says, I've been gradually, I've gradually been coming to feel like the door is no longer shut and bolted. Was it my own frantic need that slammed it in the first place? Praise is the mode of love which always has some element of joy in it. Praise in due order of him, that's God, of, as the giver, and of her, her, sorry, and of her, his wife, as the gift. That is, through trusting in Jesus, through depending on God and clinging to him, C.S. Lewis was able to praise God for his goodness. He was able to even thank God for the gift of his wife, even though they only spent three years together. And friends, in the dark night of the soul, Psalm 22 encourages us to keep holding on and trusting in God, even when it feels foolish to do so. And over time, as the feeling of loss might stay with us, God will keep strengthening us to keep trusting in him by his spirit. So to conclude, today we have seen the suffering of God's king, the deliverance of God's king, and the suffering of God's true king. And so the wonderful news of the gospel is that God has turned his face away from Jesus so that he might never turn his face away from us in forgiveness, mercy, and love. Jesus was abandoned by God so that you would never be abandoned by God. This is not something that's easy to do, so let me pray that God would help us and we as a church would help each other as we go through this. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father and gracious God, we thank you for Psalm 22 and the reminder tonight that in this sinful and broken world, that what we know to be true about you won't always match up with our experience of life. And so whether we are feeling anxiety or grief or suffering or even deep despair, Lord, help us to pray to you and cry aloud, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We thank you that Psalm 22 also points us forward to Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus, who through his death died in our place on the cross and guaranteed that we would never be abandoned by you, that we would never be left or forsaken. And so help us to cling to your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to depend on you and, and grow our trust and help us to love and care for one another as we wait for your son Jesus to return. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.